So South Africa, again, uh, we are fortunate to live in a free, open and democratic society where these kinds of debates can be had uh, and where it is possible for ideas to develop because free speech exists. Um, that really offers a great opportunity for advancement of a society. Uh, and that, of course, is the motivation that drives us. We want to see better outcomes for South Africa. We're not happy with the way things are going at the moment. What does 2023 hold for South Africa and the rest of the world? Well, this is the final episode of the Solutions Podcast for the year. So I thought it appropriate to look ahead to the coming year and also to reflect on the work that we have been doing at the Center for Risk Analysis. And I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, John Endres, who's also the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations. John Endres, welcome back to the show. Thanks for inviting me, David. It is good back. Good to be back. Um, and of course, you've uh, set quite an ambitious target for today's show, but I think also a very interesting topic to to engage in and debate. Yeah, and we often stress to our clients that we are not forecasters. We don't have a crystal ball, uh, but we are scenario planners. So we look at various uh, outcome scenarios and eventualities and uh, try to advise our clients to to sort of hedge themselves against various upside and downside scenarios. Okay, but uh, maybe we're talking about politics first, uh, and we have the ANC elective conference in December. Uh, what are some of your expectations in terms of the political trends that may emerge from that conference, and and particularly the leadership question? I think probably the, the big question on everybody's minds is going to be uh, how Cyril Ramaphosa is going to do in the contest for the presidency of the ANC. Uh, and I think on that, we are in agreement with most of the commentators and analysts that Cyril Ramaphosa is in a strong position. We'd be very surprised if he didn't make it through the election uh, and if he wasn't reelected. So we think the odds really are stacked in his favor. Um, he should make it pretty easily. Um, but the question is how strongly will he emerge out of those elections? Uh, will he get a strong mandate from the delegates? Uh, and if he does get a strong mandate, how much support does he still have within the party? And a reason why that is interesting is that we are tracking uh, rapidly declining levels of popularity for Mr. Ramaphosa in our polling. We had him at 60% uh, favorability last year in our polling. This year, he we've got him at 43%. So he's dropped a fair bit. Um, and I think this is reflected also in the kinds of attacks that you've seen happening from within the party on Mr. Ramaphosa for example, by former presidents uh, Zuma, Motlante, and Mbeki as well. Uh, so it may well be that the uh, president, the old president and the new president are the same person, but that the new president is going to be far weaker than he was before he went into the elections. Yeah, and of course, the day after his re-election, which we assume will happen, uh, then the machinations are going to kick off, that people are going to be vying for, uh, for power within the alliance and uh, succession will be on everyone's lips as well. So, um, you know, do you think that there's a risk that Mr. Ramaphosa could become a lame duck president after this year? Mm, I think there's quite a substantial risk, uh, both for uh, the reason that his popularity is declining and also for the reason that he does have the Pala Pala scandal hanging over him, which uh, is a, a sword of Damocles that uh, can drop at any time. And I think that is going to constrain his scope of action quite a bit. So if you think back to last week, the president was in the UK and had a wonderful time. He was fated. Uh, he got to ride in a carriage down the streets of London to address the joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament. So I think he really had a good time. And that must have been quite a relief from what he's encountering here every day in South Africa, where I think the knives are out. The country is in darkness, it seems, half the time. Uh, the SOEs aren't being fixed. The economy is buttering. ANC keeps falling in the polls. So it's not an entirely nice place to be, I think, to find yourself as the president of the ruling party. Yeah. And as we were commenting in a recent client webinar, Mr. Ramaphosa, when he came into office, so he had the, that first bit of uh, uh, 2018, and then he was elected on his own mandate in 2019, uh, there was this uh, very high expectation uh, for his ability to deliver, to fix some of the, the big systemic problems. But he's failed to deliver on many of those promises. And, uh, 
you know, if you also consider what has happened during his presidency, I mean, uh, there was the COVID crisis, the July 2021 riots, load shedding has really uh, deepened in terms of that crisis. Uh, so, you know, I think he's emerging on the other end of, of this term of office uh, considerably weakened. Yeah, I think that there was a honeymoon period at the beginning of his presidency where he came in with quite a lot of goodwill and a lot of hopes riding on him. Uh, if you think about what we'd experienced as a country before that, the Zuma presidency, I think, was quite challenging uh, because of the per pervasive corruption that took hold of the country. Um, economic performance was declining during, the, during that time as well. Um, so there was the expectation that Mr. Ramaphosa would bring a breath of fresh air into the presidency. Uh, and he probably did have quite a lot of political capital, despite the closeness of the election that brought him uh, into the top office within the ANC. But that political capital, we think, has not really been uh, well used at all. Uh, and probably both our uh, friends and our opponents across the political aisle would agree on that. Um, you know, if, if you think of the resolutions adopted by the 2017 ANC conference on expropriation without compensation, for example, on the nationalization of the Reserve Bank and various other matters, um, the uh, uh, people endorsing those policies will say that he has been very slow to deliver. You know, expropriation without compensation is still in progress in a way that the constitutional amendment was defeated last year. Um, it is now being pushed through the expropriation bill and the land court bill, but it all seems a bit slow and a bit feeble. Um, so I think both the, 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 the party members and also the opponents would say that the president has not really delivered. And I think that is a, a, a weak position to be in going into any election. And the president's a big fan of consensus seeking social compacts, but actually what this amounts to is kind of delaying and temporizing and not really making any decisions. And meanwhile, the, the fundamental problems in South Africa get worse. Um, so I don't think that that was the correct strategy given the context in which he ascended to office. All right, so you mentioned policy now. I mean, I think something that we've been trying to disabuse our clients of is this idea that Mr. Ramaphosa is a frustrated reformer. Uh, but actually, if you look at the policy agenda, that's not really uh, reformist. Um, or if it is reformist, it's uh, reforming towards radicalism rather than liberalization. Um, so we have the EWC question, which you mentioned. Uh, we now have the expropriation bill that is passed through the National Assembly before the National Council of Provinces that could be passed through at any moment. Um, and all that would require is the president's signature. Then we also have the NHI bill, the National Health Insurance Bill, which is also being rushed through Parliament. There's the Land Court Bill as well. Uh, so this doesn't look like a, an administration that is keen to encourage investment and stimulate economic growth. It's kind of maybe more playing towards some of these populist impulses. In a way, it seems that uh, Mr. Ramaphosa, despite often being contrasted against the RET faction within the ANC, may be said to be heading the RET faction because he has adopted the worst policies of that faction, including uh, cadre deployment, which he has uh, supported very enthusiastically in the face of severe criticism, including EWC, where after the failure of the constitutional amendment, he has been uh, uh, still championing it, at, as he did at the July conference of the ANC the policy conference. So that that is still on track. Uh, we have a tightening of race-based labor legislation in the form of the Employment Equity Amendment Bill. Uh, that's also coming down the line. And all of these pieces of legislation really are very much of a mold um, in the sense that they place the state at the center of the economy um, and grant very far-reaching powers to ministers and officials to interfere in the lives of ordinary citizens. Uh, if one wanted to be charitable, this is done in the expectation that more government power will allow the government to produce better results. Um, but of course, our interpretation is quite different. And we believe that it is already the intrusiveness and domineering nature of the government, combined with its ineptitude in many fields, that has led to the bad outcomes that we've got at the moment. And doubling out on those things is going to make things worse rather than better. Yeah. And another charitable reading of his actions is that He's trying to outflank his opponents on the extreme ends of the, the ideological spectrum, uh, you know, the ultra leftists of the EFF or the, the RET faction. Um, but in many ways, he's just playing into their hands. Uh, he's uh, 
basically giving effect to some of their most important policy pillars. I think something that's also quite interesting is he tends to uh, have a bit of a soft hand with his cabinet. I mean, if you think that Lindiwe Sisulu is openly critical of the president and his actions, and there she remains uh, still in the cabinet, uh, you know, a stronger leader would have just dismissed her. All right. So, uh, John, where do you see uh, South Africa more broadly in terms of the, the socioeconomic context? Because you were recently on a road trip through KwaZulu-Natal. You spoke at a variety of town hall functions and met people. And, you know, I think that that's really critical for the work that we do. We don't want to just be sitting behind our laptops theorizing. We want to uh, get out there. Um, what were some of your observations, particularly around the state of KwaZulu-Natal at the moment, we had a video on the CRA channel about this recently, but what do you think is the the conditions on the ground there? You know, are we looking at potentially another powder keg moment? I think KwaZulu Natal is quite a, a distinct place within South Africa. Um, it was of course one of the the four colonies that joined in. Well, one of the colonies that joined in to form the Union of South Africa in 1910. One of the two colonies, I should say, um, and it is uh, uh, an area that is, I think, characterized by quite high levels of conflict and I think has been for a very long time, um, decades, if not centuries. And that is continuing at the moment. Um, so we found that people are, on the one hand, quite resilient. Um, they've been exposed to great challenges in the past. They have survived those challenges. They have mastered the challenges in some cases, but those challenges aren't going away. Um, and what we found on our most recent trip is that there's now an added concern within the province, which is that a weakening of the ANC and a weakening of the state exposes private citizens to even more threats than they have been before, in the sense that these power vacuums that are opening up are creating space for powerful actors to move in and uh, take over. And that would include uh, both, let's say, uh, law-abiding and well-meaning actors and actors that are not law-abiding, law but rather make the law um, where they come in. And what they are doing, um, these actors, is effectively competing with the state. If you wanted to take a, uh, uh, an image of the state as a kind of protection racket where you, you pay your taxes in exchange for being kept safe and for having your contracts enforced and having sound currency at your disposal, um, that deal is breaking down. And that is where, where people are feeling that you know, we're, we're getting a really a, a bad deal here because we keep paying taxes and, and supporting the state, but we are not being protected from violence and from crime as we should be. Uh, and that is, of course, very much a phenomenon of the construction mafias that I be believe began in KwaZulu-Natal. But there are various other maf mafias as well that are um, uh, taking over the state or replacing the state or pushing aside the state. And leaving ordinary citizens quite exposed um, because either you you strike a deal uh, and you, you you live with with a new situation and you accept that somebody else is now protecting you instead of the state, or um, you you are exposed to violence uh, in your lives, in your families, in in your personal property as well, and you can fight back. So the risk for for more violence, I think, is very pronounced, especially in KwaZulu Natal, uh, because many people are not going to take these challenges lying down. So, you know, I think the risk of conflict is high. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting if you think of this power vacuum that is currently in place in KwaZulu-Natal, something will fill that. Um, and that could be criminal syndicates or it could be communities coming together and establishing uh, order, but that requires uh, doing things a bit differently and not necessarily abdicating responsibility to the state far away in Pretoria, uh, but actually going a bit more local and, and trying to build from the bottom up, which is a big theme of this show, uh, decentralization, subsidiarity, and uh, devolution of power. Um, just in terms of, of those concepts, John, I mean, uh, that those might seem like kind of abstractions, but, you know, why do you, we at the, the Institute, and now myself in my new role at the Free Market Foundation, how do we give expression to these ideas and why are those ideas important? I think one of the reasons those ideas are important is because we recognize that we are fallible um, as individuals, and we believe that that fallibility also extends to other people. And the implication is that you know, if, you, if you give other people the power to make decisions over your life, 
you have to recognize that there is the risk of fallibility and of wrong decisions. That's inevitable. And you can, to some extent, mitigate that risk by spreading the power more widely. So in other words, you don't want to have just one person making decisions on behalf of everyone. You'd rather want to break it down and you want uh, competing uh, alternatives to be explored. So ideally, you know, you, you want a kind of federal system where each state or each province has quite a lot of autonomy, can do things differently and can experiment because that is how you find out which the best solutions are. And you also protect yourself from the risk of bad solutions. Um, so it might turn out, you know, that the uh, Northwest province hits upon an approach to governance that is far more successful than that uh, than any other province. And that then becomes a model that the other provinces can use. Um, and you don't really have that option in a centralized system where everybody does the same thing because the same rules are applied everywhere and the same people in power apply their thinking throughout. So subsidiarity is really is, is, is a reflection of, of fallibility and the recognition that you learn a lot of things by trying them out, by experimenting, by testing them. That involves risks and you mitigate those risks by having experiments spread out across many communities or provinces uh, instead of having everything centralized in one place. So I think it's quite a quite a deep fundamental uh, and philosophical approach that underlies uh, the, the the reasoning for being in favor of subsidiarity and decentralization. Yeah, and centralization tends to breed bureaucracy, slow decision making, uh, concentration of power as well, uh, which can be very easily abused. Uh, so spreading power down and out actually is very important for accountability for preventing that concentration of power and also is much more responsive to local dynamics. Um, and yeah, you know, if you think of the history of South Africa, we've always had these quite strong leaders in a way, whether it's a philosopher king like Jan Smuts or Tavo Mbeki as a kind of an officious bureaucrat or um, a, a kind of authoritarian bully like P.W. Boeta or a charismatic semi-divine figure like Nelson Mandela. But actually, we kind of need to move away from this model um, mm. of kind of pinning our hopes on on one individual and and actually kind of building uh, systems more on the ground level um, and and spreading power. I think it's it's also important to recognize there is a price to pay for decentralization, and that is that it's more expensive uh, in the sense that uh, if you think back to the early two thousands. Well, late 1990s uh, in Johannesburg, for example, there were multiple municipalities. You know, Randburg was a municipality and Santon was one. And there were all sorts of, of other little places that e all ran themselves. So it was quite decentralized. And other under the ANC, those places were then centralized first, I think, into five metropolitan substructures and then into the single metro of Johannesburg. And the reasoning at the time was that you can save a lot of costs because instead of having you know 25 accounting departments for each municipality and 25 HR departments and 25 this department and that department put all together in one place and you're going to save quite a lot. So there's a cost to decentralization. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to be aware of that cost, but from our perspective, the benefits you gain out of it are so significant that that cost is certainly worth, worth bearing. Uh, and that also speaks to your point, I think, in terms of placing all of your hopes in the one leader, um, that is something we still see in our polling, where people become quite upset at the notion of fragmentation of the political um, landscape of many different parties having to work together in coalitions. Um, there is the the desire to uh, to see some consolidation uh, and for some leadership. We say, you know, where, where's the leader who will keep it all together? Or why can't we just have two parties like they've got in the United States or, or the UK to some extent? Um, but I think that that model is probably on its way out in South Africa. Yeah, I've often heard it say that our constitution was designed with a Mandela in mind, but what we got was a Jacob Zuma. Um, and I think that that's uh, quite a, an important lesson. All right. So, you know, if we look at where South Africa is at the moment, and we've got these power outages, the economy is contracting, the finance minister is only projecting it at about 1.6% in terms of economic growth. Um, you know, these are some pretty significant headwinds. Our infrastructure is collapsing around us. Um, how do businesses operate within this en environment? Because uh, this is pretty difficult operating conditions. Uh, how do we begin to protect value, protect savings and investments and deploy capital in a way that will produce returns 
but also being realistic about the the kind of environment that we're in. Yeah, that's very challenging, David. Um, but I think what we've also seen is that many South African businesses have really adapted very well to that challenging environment. Um, and so what we hear from the corporate clients we speak to and what we see also speaking to international organizations that deal with South Africa is that there's recognition that South African businesses have proved quite resilient and adaptable. They have faced many challenges, um, but many many companies have survived in a surprisingly strong shape as well. Um, there's one insurance industry contact that we have uh, who says that going into COVID, they expected you know, massive uh, losses in their insurance business because either businesses would cancel their insurance or would go under and wouldn't be able to pay the premiums anymore. And he says that didn't happen at all. They they came through COVID pretty, pretty strongly. Uh, and the businesses that they work with all seem to have done pretty well as well. So I think that uh, uh, difficult environments breed strong businesses. South Africa is an example of that. Uh, and that is the, also the answer to your question. How do you do that? You have to be innovative. You have to be nimble. Uh, you have to be well informed about what's going on in your environment. You can't afford to be taken by surprise, and you also need to diversify. You can't have all your eggs in one basket. And it brings us back to the topic of subsidiarity and decentralization. Um, you know, this uh, this is the kind of environment where that that really you have to do that. This uh, environment is too dynamic, too challenging uh, for most businesses to be able to be run on a centralized basis uh, with just a single product in the market. You need multiple products, multiple markets, uh, multiple business units if you are large enough in order to adapt to this environment. Yeah, and if you are exposed to a particular industry that has heavy government regulation, where at, at a moment's notice, you could be regulated out of your business, or if you're dependent on a state contract, I would say that that's a very risky position to be in. And you know, I just wanted to maybe use this opportunity, John, just to talk about uh, the role of organizations like ours. You're the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations. You've been heading the organization now for a couple of years. And I'm going to be going into this new role at the Free Market Foundation. Why do think tanks like ours exist? And what is their evolving role? Because in the past, they used to be kind of mostly putting out kind of academic papers and journal articles and conducting research and almost having this kind of objective detachment from the society that they were observing. But I mean, if you think of the IRR in particular, it's very much involved in the battle of ideas, advancing a certain set of principles and waving the flag for the classical liberal tradition. Uh, could you reflect on how think tanks like the IRR are evolving? Maybe a comment on that first, where we say, you know, that this is what think tanks do. There are many countries where think tanks don't do that or can't do that or don't exist, which can do this. Um, so, you know, if you think of, of Russia to some extent, think of countries like Venezuela, um, you know, that, that are facing very severe governance challenges of their own uh, and have democracy deficits, uh, which are very significant as well. They do have organizations, they do have think tanks, but they don't seem to be having quite the same impact. And I think that is partly because the operating environment doesn't let them operate freely um, as we are able to in South Africa, mm. but maybe also because the approach they choose is a different approach to that we choose here in South Africa. Uh, and as you said, our approach is based on the this notion of the battle of ideas. And put very simply, the idea is that um, if you look at the outcomes that are produced in our economy and society, often they are not what we would like to see. Um, so in terms of growth, job creation, poverty, we can see that on all those indicators, we're underperforming. And our contention is that this is a result of bad policies, which are not conducive to growth, to investment, to job creation. And if you go back further along the um, policy value chain, before the policy formulation, you'll find the ideas that underlie the policies. So there are very fundamental ideas about the role of the state, for example, should it be very powerful? Should it be centralized or should it be decentralized? Uh, do we assume that bureaucrats are able to plan uh, for the society in great detail and do so successfully? Or is it something that needs to emerge spontaneously almost out of the interaction of free individuals? Those are very deep, deep ideas. And what think tanks like the IRR do and what the Free Market Foundation did in the past and uh, will probably do in, in future without wanting to preempt 
your plans. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> exactly is getting the ideas out there that we think are going to produce good results um so like decentralization like individual freedom um, like treating people equally equality before the law really basic things and promote these quite vociferously you know our opponents uh, promote their ideas strongly as well as they should because the way you get to a conclusion is through this battle of ideas through debate through argument in the public square and we think it is a sign of a healthy society that is able to accommodate this kind of debate, um, this kind of dissent as well, disagreement, and that is able to uh, evolve on the basis of the insights gained from those debates. So South Africa, again, uh, we are fortunate to live in a free, open and democratic society where these kinds of debates can be had uh, and where it is possible for ideas to develop because free speech exists. Um, that really offers a great opportunity for advancement of a society. Uh, and that, of course, is the motivation that drives us. We want to see better outcomes for South Africa. We're not happy with the way things are going at the moment. Yeah, and like our erstwhile late colleague, uh, John Ken Berman, noted, free speech is the weapon with which we conduct our, our affairs. So that's why we, we very jealously guard that right. Uh, but, yeah, I think, you know, we also have to ask some difficult questions of ourselves. Like, are we actually winning this battle of ideas? Um, I think we're definitely putting up a good fight. Uh, but if you look at the litany of of hostile laws that are now in the statute books, um, I think uh, you can maybe say that we've still got our work cut out for us. Uh, so some cynics might say, oh, well, what's the point? You know, you, you don't really have political power. So why do you even engage in these fights? What, what would you say to those, those critics? Well, one thing I would say is that I did research on change management. Uh, and one thing that you see across the literature is this notion that you have periods of stability uh, in organizations, in societies that alternate with periods of transition where things shift around quite a lot and move into a different stable configuration. And I think South Africa is heading into that kind of time. And that is a reason to be optimistic about where South Africa is. Uh, for 30 years, um, you know, a, a single party has been dominant. Uh, a single ideology and worldview has been dominant in South Africa. Before that, of course, that was the case as well um, under apartheid and the National Party. And now for the first time, we're seeing the, the cracks beginning to appear and we're beginning to see an opening up. And that creates the space for think tanks to put their ideas into the public domain in great volume at scale, um, as we've been doing over, over many years already, and to see a shift in policy emerging from that. So I'd say, you know, the battle of ideas is not a, a short thing. It's not a quick thing. It is something that takes place over years and sometimes decades. Uh, but ultimately, it is what determines the outcomes that you get. And I think we're getting to the point now where uh, the battle of ideas is going to be very visible in the outcomes that we get as we follow the political transition in South Africa in 2024 and the following years. Yeah, and the term that you've used in the past is punctuated equilibrium, which I think is a very good metaphor. And yeah, as Ernest Hemingway once wrote, uh, the, the change happens gradually and then suddenly. Um, and I think it's, you always have a kind of a status quo bias. You kind of analyze things in the way that, that you currently see them. And then when change comes, it takes you by surprise. But then retrospectively, you think, oh, okay, we could see the sequence of events that led up to that change. But, but you didn't actually at the time. Exactly. And, and that is how you get taken by surprise because you extrapolate from, from a stable present and a stable you know, recent past. And you, you draw your trend line and you say, well, this is you know, where, where things are going. Uh, but it is the the structural breaks in developments that take you by surprise, where things turn around quite sharply. Uh, and of course, South Africa experienced that at the age, at the end of the eighties, beginning of the nineties, where 1986, 87, 88, you know, you would have drawn your trend line in a straight line. You would have said, "I can see where this is going." You know, this is just continuous oppression and suffering and uh, racial segregation, um, and and worsening economic outcomes. It's just a terrible situation to be in. And then you got that structure break in, in 1990 with de Klerk's speech on the 2nd of February, which, which started you know, cracking open that, that structure and started allowing something else to emerge from it. And I think we're, we're now heading into a similar period in South Africa. Yeah, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said that life can only be understood looking backwards, but it must be lived going forwards. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I think that uh, still holds true today. All right, so just in terms of where you see an organization like the IR going in the future, I mean, 
what do you think are the the biggest fights that are going to characterize next year and the years to come? You mentioned 2024. That's going to be a really make or break year for South Africa. Those elections really going to determine the future trajectory of this country. What role do you see the IRR playing in this mix? I think that you can break it down into two areas. And the, the one area would be policy. Um, so ultimately, if we want things to get better in South Africa, we need better policies. The IR is going to continue writing policies uh, and making submissions to parliament, commenting on existing policies, proposing better ones um, as a way to shift the conversation and, and just you know create the awareness that other solutions are possible that would be more successful. That is the one area. The second area is really the political area where uh, it is becoming quite apparent, we think, that South Africa is changing uh, from a one-party dominant system to a coalition-based system. And this is going to be a tricky period because coalitions are really hard to manage, but they are a natural outflow of our electoral system, which is proportional representation-based. And ultimately, we think that it is political parties that are able to uh, exist within coalitions that are going to be successful. And therefore, it is incumbent upon political parties to figure that out. Um, there's no good wailing about it and wishing for dominance once again, because that's not going to happen. If you want to be successful, you've got to make it work in a coalition. And that means you have to think about how to work with other political parties and with other people who think differently from you. You know, you, you need to figure out what com common ground you've got the points you can agree on, uh, uh, and what you don't what you don't agree on, how you handle disagreement, how you handle dissent, and how you are still able to build a basis, a platform that allows you to implement policies informed on your worldview and your ideas, uh, and that really is where the opportunity lies now. It's the the confluence of the the political constellations emerging from a coalition environment, together with the policies that emerge from those political constellations. Yeah, and I think to your first point, policy is certainly very important. You know, you need a conducive policy and regulatory environment um, with clearly defined and transparent rules. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that policy making is is kind of just like a technical exercise. But actually, policy is the expression of the prevailing ideas of the time. That's why we focus on that ideological realm, trying to influence the climate of public opinion. So we'll certainly do the parliamentary submissions and the policy proposals, uh, but the ultimate aim is to to change the ideological orientation of, of South Africa. True. Um, what also happens is that I do think people in power, when they see their policies failing, get to the point where they are concerned about that and would like to do things differently, but don't quite know how. And I think that is where the alternative policy proposals come in. So, you know, say say you are somebody who has supported BEE for many years uh, and has done so for noble reasons. You know, you're, you're trying to rectify the injustices of the past. You're trying to create a more equitable situation in the present through race-based legislation. Um, but now you're looking at the outcomes. And if you're being honest, you have to say this hasn't been great. You know, you've sort of empowered a small percentage of the black population, maybe 10 or 15 percent, which is you know, good. But 85 or 90% are worse off, um, and therefore your policies failed. So now you're going to start thinking about what could replace it. You know, Do you just scrap it and replace it with nothing? You could do that. Or do you scrap it and replace it with something else that is more effective uh, and more geared to the task? And there is a point where it then becomes helpful to be able to look to a think tank, to look at publications out in the public domain, and say, for example, look, the IRR has got the uh, economic empowerment for the disadvantaged policy, which will help with empowerment, uh, but it won't be race-based. It will be needs-based. And that kind of a policy would be far preferable to one that is race-based. Why don't we try that? Um, so yeah, so I think putting the policies out there is important because you are giving people something to hold on to when they start looking around for better alternatives. Yeah, and politicians will be looking for a way to save face. So there's a ready-made uh, kind of policy alternative that they can just kind of s slowly adopt uh, or slide into, then uh, that's beneficial for them. Um, but then, yeah, you know, that means you've got to play the long game. You've got to be pretty consistent um, and also brave. You need to be able to go against the grain of public opinion, uh, which is uh, not always easy to do, but 
you know, if you think of the the responsibility of leadership, we often talk about kind of business leaders and political leaders in our society, but actually leadership is about often taking the difficult road and carrying people along with you who may not be willing to do that, right? If you think of yeah. F.W. de Klerk, he, he had to do that. Uh, Gorbachev had to do that. Um, and, you know, going back to our earlier discussion around Mr. Ramaphosa, uh, this trying to please everyone actually ends up with a highly suboptimal outcome. Um, you know, so I think organizations like the IR and the FMF, you know, people might see their actions as uh, being too uh, aggressive or assertive and, you know, well, you know, why don't we enter into dialogue with the government and, and try to persuade uh, through kind of backroom channels rather than, uh, you know, starting fights in the public domain. But politicians respond to pressure and you also need to be robust in defending the values that, that you believe in. Um, it doesn't mean that you must necessarily be a dogmatist or, you know, picking fights with everyone, but you've got to be firm, uh, you know, you can't be diluting something fundamental like property rights. Like you either have property rights or you don't. You, you can't be half pregnant, right? So you have to you have to be prepared to to fight for what you believe in when when necessary. That's right. And and in a sense, we are in a in a privileged position being in think tanks um, because we're able to take principled positions um, and we have we face less pressure, I think, to compromise than people in the political parties do, for example. Uh, in the political party, you know, every clear position that you take is going to alienate someone. You lose voters every single time that you take a principled position. Uh, and a think tank, that's also the case. You know, every time you take a principled position, you get people attacking you, and that's fine. Um, you know, that's that's not really a problem. But being out there, um, sort of in, putting yourself in the firing line, I think is valuable to those members of society who might agree with your stances, but might be too scared to espouse them publicly. Uh, and to give you one example here, we uh, understand the motivation of those who argue for affirmative action and race-based policy, but who also think that it is important to have a voice out in society advocating for strict non-racialism and saying, you know, we, we actually think that racial classification is not the right approach. Um, and somebody should, should be saying that. And we are the ones saying that. Uh, we catch a lot, a, lot, a lot of flack for it. Um, but it is a position we believe to be the right one. Uh, it should be represented by someone. And it is an argument that should be in the public domain and that should be able to uh, win or lose based on its merits. And in that in that kind of battle, I think it is uh, quite appropriate to be firm uh, and to be uh, clear in what you stand for uh, and to give people the opportunity to engage with those ideas and to decide whether they agree or disagree. Well, John, I wanted to thank you very much for your leadership at the Institute. And I certainly have personally benefited very much from working with you. And I will take a lot of the lessons from that experience into my new role at the FMF. Um, and I will certainly be staying very close to you and our other colleagues at the Institute. Uh, but I am reminded of this quote by um, Friedrich Hayek from The Road to Serfdom. It says that nothing makes conditions more unbearable than the knowledge that no effort of ours can change them. And I think the IR really embodies that spirit, that South Africa is worth fighting for. Freedom is important. We want people to live lives of their choosing. Uh, we want them to be prosperous. We want them to be free and empowered uh, economic agents. And uh, we want to see South Africa thrive. And I think the work that we do every day I hope we'll get South Africa and South Africans to that point of, of more freedom. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say a very personal thank you uh, to you and to the rest of my colleagues at the Institute. And uh, yeah, our thanks to you as well, David. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who wishes you well in your new role. Um, I think it's a really important uh, place that you're going to, an important uh, position that you'll be occupying. And I do hope that the Free Market Foundation becomes uh, an influential and impactful voice in South Africa's public debate, because we need to have lots of think tanks in the in the public debate, in the battle of ideas, uh, to make it a, a worthwhile battle. So, Sterkte, uh, more strength to your elbow, and uh, thank you very much for everything that you've done for us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words, John. This will be the last episode of the Solutions Podcast for 2022. I wanted to thank you, my audience, for joining me for these weekly conversations. I've really enjoyed them. 
I'm going to be taking a bit of a break in December, contemplating what I will be doing with this platform in the new year. So it might be a little while until you see me again or hear my voice, but I very much enjoy doing this. So hopefully I can still do it in one capacity or another. My name is David Ansara. Until we speak again, take care.